So in Exodus 33, we have Moses asking God to show him his glory, to show him his physical presence. And God agrees, but only to show him his back. He says to Moses, you cannot see my face because no one can see me and live. So even Moses couldn't see God's face because Moses was human and had sin within him. And God is so perfect, like water with fire, his holiness would have destroyed that sin and the person's sin was within. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, we have God appearing in the sky, or as the angel of the Lord, or as a burning bush. But nobody comes face to face with him as he really is. Nobody sees his face. Just to draw close to him, there have to be these complicated ceremonies that go on for pages and pages in the Old Testament with pure animals slaughtered as blood sacrifices to atone for sin. In the tabernacle, there was the Holy of Holies where God's presence would dwell behind the curtain. And one day a year, the high priest could enter. But even then, he had to have incense burning to produce thick smoke to hide the mercy seat where God was. Because anyone who saw God would die instantly. So what does this tell us? That sin was and is a major problem to God. He couldn't just click his fingers and say, Okay, I know you guys are full of sin, but it doesn't matter. Come and be close to me. Come and see my face. He is who he is. Holiness is his nature. We don't ask gravity to stop making things fall down. We can't expect God to just accept sin. It's his nature. So that should be a major problem for us. Because, and this is moving on to point two, we can't help but sin. Ever since Adam and Eve turned their backs on God in the Garden of Eden, human beings have been corrupted by sin. We ignore what God wants because we'd rather do what we want. And even when we really want to do the right thing, when we want to do what God wants us to do, we still can't do it. We fall short. We fail. That's the way we are. That's, we are who we are. The Apostle Paul explains this in Romans 7. He writes, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. All right, now here's a question. Would you prefer for your husband or wife or partner to be programmed like a robot to love you exactly as you want them to love you, always do what you want them to do and never let you down? Or would you prefer them to make their own choice to love you in their own way, even though that means they won't always do what you want them to do and they'll often let you down? <laughs> don't answer, because I want you to be part of but seriously, I think that explains why God allows us to have sin in our heart. Why he didn't just crush Satan the serpent before he could sliver his way to Adam and Eve. God gave us free will because he wants us to choose to love him. Not to simply obey and love him because we were programmed like robots to do that. Now if we're all honest with ourselves, we can think of countless examples where we wanted to do the right thing, but we simply didn't. So, you know, we see a homeless person in the street and we think, I really should help them. Got a warm house, got enough food to share, they could sleep on the sofa. But then we think, ah, yeah, but if I let them stay over, they'll probably rob me while I'm sleeping. So I won't do that. Or we think, I'm really busy today, I'll do it tomorrow. But we don't. Sin is powerful. It has a grip on us. All right, so we talked about the nature of God and how his holiness means he cannot coexist with sin. And we talk about our nature as human beings and why we cannot help but sin. So humans and God should not be compatible, right? We shouldn't be able to see him. Our sin is too big a barrier. God can't just click his fingers and be okay with sin. And we can never stop sinning. And that's where Jesus comes in, obviously. Um, so we're so familiar with the story of Jesus that we've almost become desensitised to the message. We hear someone say, Jesus gave his life so that you could be saved. And we just think, oh, that's nice. So I want to try and put it into some sort of modern human context, what he actually did. So imagine you're on trial in Alabama, 
in the US where they still have the death penalty. You're found guilty and sentenced to death. But before you can be led away by the guards, the judge comes down from the bench and tells you and everyone else that he's going to take your punishment for you. He's going to die in your place. And that's exactly what Jesus has done for us. A sacrifice was needed to pay the price for our sins in order for us to be saved and be with God. That's just the way it is. There had to be justice. All logic would suggest that we should have been the ones to pay the price. But Jesus loves us so much and wants to be with us so much that he chose to be the sacrifice. He chose to pay the price once and for all. No more animal sacrifices, no more barrier between us and him. Jesus' willing death was the sacrifice that tore down the barrier of sin for eternity. And let's see God's face. And that's why the curtain blocking the holy callings in the tabernacle was torn from the top down when Jesus died on the cross. God tore it down from above. So here's another issue that I've struggled with as a relatively new Christian. So was Jesus' death really that big of a sacrifice to him and God? So he died an excruciating death, yes, but he rose again three days later and was back at the right hand of God 40 days later. So in the grand scheme of things, was it all that bad? So to go back to the parent-child analogy, how would you feel if you had to send your child to be tortured, humiliated and brutally murdered and then sent him to hell for three days? How, how would you feel if you knew that was going to happen to you? But perhaps the worst part of it for Jesus was that his sacrifice included losing the presence of God, his Father. Again, for those of you who are married or in a long-term relationship, imagine how you'd feel if your spouse or partner just turned their back on you, withdrew their love. And it's infinitely more painful for Jesus because the love we feel for each other as humans is like a raindrop compared to the ocean of love between God and Jesus in the triune relationship. So we get an idea of how terrifying the anticipation of this crucifixion was for the human Jesus when in Gethsemane he prayed, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And then we hear the agony of the experience when, as Jesus is dying, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Still, we can't really understand the magnitude of Jesus' sacrifice in this life, but there are some things that we just can't fully grasp now. What we do know is we can never live a life worthy of God on our own. So Jesus lived a life without sin on our behalf, and then he died the excruciating death our sins deserve. By sacrificing himself for us on the cross, Jesus took the punishment for all of our sins at once. This made him the ultimate sacrifice, once and for all satisfying the demands God's justice required. Which brings us finally back to the end of today's passage, where Jesus said to the criminal, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And why did Jesus tell this criminal, this sinner, that he would be with him in heaven? Simply because the man said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The man accepted Jesus as the Son of God and his Saviour, and so Jesus saved him. It was that simple. That's how salvation works. We don't earn our salvation through our good work. We never could. We can't stop sinning. We might do lots of brilliant things, but in our heart we will always sin. So our salvation was earned for us through Jesus' sacrifice. And Jesus says to you individually, and everyone who embraces him as their Messiah, Truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. So we know that Jesus died so that we could experience an intimate father-child relationship with God. But what do we do with this knowledge in our daily lives? And the answer is really simple, and yet the result is mind-blowing. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So we simply have to find each time to open our hearts to Jesus, each day find that time. In the scripture we see that Jesus would go to quiet places to pray and I think we need to do the same. It could be first thing in the morning, last thing at night, on your lunch break, 
and it doesn't have to be long, 10 or 15 minutes, whatever works for you. But we have to make that time to be quiet and still and ask Jesus to show us his love. And he will answer. And, and knowing just how much he loves you, the Father who is willing to die for you, it transforms the way you see the world. So it's really simple, it's just making time each day to actually be quiet and still and reach out to him. And he always answers. Should we pray? Lord Jesus, our Father, we pray that your word on the cross will impact us in our hearts today. We pray that you won't just walk out of church thinking, God loves me, that's nice, and then go home and forget about the significance of what you did. We pray that we'll have the faith and the discipline to find quiet time to ask you to show us your love for us. Because we know that when we pause and listen to hear you knocking and truly open the door to you, you always come in. We might not always feel your presence immediately. In your wisdom, you show us how much you love us just when we need it most. Lord, we pray simply to draw closer to you, to know you better, to know the power of your love for us. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go into um, a time of effective worship now. Um, we're going to nick a little bit of what um, another group did um, a couple of weeks ago, and um, we've got some, some candles up here. So um, we're going to be inviting you to come up and um, light a candle. You can do that either whilst you're singing, um, the band is going to continue just to um, play the music, so you can have time just to have some quiet reflection. Um, those of you who wish to light a candle, um, please do so. You um, can light a candle to recommit your faith to God, um, or any reason um, you wish to. Lighting a candle is a reminder of our faith and commitment to God. And lit candles in church are an important expression of light as manifestation of God's love. So, so we do invite you to come up and come up. There's something um, quite kinesthetic about actually coming up and actually doing something. And so for, for me, um, being a kinesthetic kind of learner, I like to be able to actually do the doing. And I think sometimes when you actually do the doing, it just has more impact. So um, that's why we invite you to come up and come up. So um, Oh, um, just before that, um, sorry, there will be, um, will be a, um, a prayer um, up on the, on the screen. I'm just going to say it now, just so that you can just start this, this time of kind of reflection. So, Lord, accept this burning candle as a sign of my faith and love to you. Like this candle, I am ready to be used in your service without asking why and for what purpose. I wish to stand in your presence and to be consumed in the light and warmth of your love. Please hear my prayer. And if, you'll, if it will be your will, grant my petition. Above all, make me loyal and faithful to you in all circumstances of my life. Amen.
obviously um, a time in prayer.
the King Jesus in your mercy, here like that. And Lord, to you, we lift up our world, Lord. Oh there is so much pain and suffering. May you give um, your wisdom and teach us how to pray. May your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And thank you for the churches and the workers, um, serving our brothers and sisters across the globe, um, particularly in the current uh, turmoil of wars and global food crisis. Thank you that you are supporting individuals. Um, and we pray that their ministry and their work may continue to grow and set people free from chains of spiritual and material poverty for your glory. And Lord, we particularly lift up the Ukraine Russia crisis family. Will you bring stability there? May you bring healing, may you bring forgiveness um, and an end to the conflict. And Lord, we also lift up particularly East Africa and the food shortages, the different inflation going on across the world, um, and the persecution of particularly women in the Middle East women. Lord, these areas break our hearts and Lord, they should be broken even more. Help us to see and help us to pray with your eyes for these areas. In Jesus, in your mercy, be our prayer. And to conclude, God, our God, you are our God, you are our King. Will you um, help us pray in line with your will throughout this week? We know that you are a good and sovereign help. Please help us to trust you as we go out into our world and be your salt and light. We to end with our final hymn, which is the Christ name. Thank you.
Christ of the cross. Though we are undeserving, we praise you for your love. Though we are slow to understand, we praise you for your patience. Though we are quick to defend ourselves at the expense of others, we praise you for your grace. Inspire us not to look only to our world, to your kingdom of love and freedom. We praise and thank you for all that you have done and continue to do for us.